they're worried about the the big people, the ones that are growing for the stores, the ones that are growing for, um, you know, that have contracts with the government to distribute their product. Oh, I agree because look at what COVID has done is wiped out almost every small business and independently owned business mm-hmm. across the world. So everything's back to corporate control of all business, pretty much. I'm not going to say a hundred percent. You know, how many businesses have, have gone out of business since the COVID thing? A Millions, lot. plural. <laughs> the thing that I see with the, or the restrictions was to wipe out all small business. Well, now you need to wipe out all small farms. So then everything still comes under corporate control. And now it's just the next step of consolidation and If you think today's technology is bad for privacy, virtual reality is perfect for tracking everything a user does, sees, and feels in the virtual world. Tech giants will continue to steal as much private information as they can from you. That's why I won't get online without a Virtual Shield VPN, which routes my data through encrypted virtual tunnels, limiting the ability to be tracked across the internet. You can head over to virtualshield.com and in the download tab, I'm going to choose Firefox and click install now to add the Virtual Shield add on. It's just that easy. And get started with your free 30 day trial. Install it, click connect. You'll see the shield turn from red to green. And you'll see how from my initial service provider, I was able to even change my IP Virtual Shield network protected. Virtual Shield is offering 50% off plus a free 30-day trial for all new customers today. Go to virtualshield.com forward slash adapt2030. And now on with the video. And good afternoon, everyone. Guess who I have back? Ryder Lee. Mm -hmm. So much positive feedback raised by giants. You know, we were trying to connect some dots. So what do you see moving forward or what do you see, I guess, the narrative or the next moves, the next chess pieces being moved around? What what do we envision for the next year here? I have from May and then to the end of the year kind of sussed out in terms of months and and quarters that things will change. But what are you thinking now? It's going to take a lot of time and uh, to get people to organically go and steal people's um, food and steal their crops in the United States uh, because we're good people here, right? We, we, we have good hearts and we normally have each other's back. So I feel like the only way that that's really going to happen here is if we are at the lowest point that we could possibly be, right? Where we are completely starving, we have nothing and we're hungry. The people that have been used so far to bring us to this point, if they organize them as the organized portion, not the hungry family looking for food, but as an organized thing, as it has been in so many cities, if they were pushed down the countryside and said, hey, we will pay you to go do this out there, they know that there's going to be a lot, a lot that will not come back, like an enormous amount. Mm -hmm. So perhaps they're counting on that is that's the way you get rid of them. Because, you know, in all these revolutions, they use the foot soldiers first and then they need to get rid of them anyway, because then they become the threat because they become too organized. And you've seen this through history. I don't care what chapter of history you you want to dive into. There's going to be a a myriad of ways that this thing will be spun to arrive at that last point where military and troops will be stationed in the farms just out of what you appear something different. But then it will suddenly flip 180 degrees one day because they couldn't occupy these areas down here. Yeah, there's not enough uh, there's not enough people to do that. The, the military isn't isn't big enough because if you had all the military in the United States then, you know, who, who's occupying other countries, right? They don't have enough manpower to be able to do that. So I see it as they will protect the the biggest places that are um manufacturing and growing the most amount of food and the most amount of crops. And then they'll leave the, the, the smaller and the little, littler people uh, to their own devices. Right. And whatever happens to them is what happens to them. And it won't, it won't really matter and won't really make a difference because, you know, when, if that's what happens, then it's going to, 
it's going to be devastating to a lot of people and it's going to catch a lot of people off guard. But I don't think that they're so much worried about the the smaller people and the people that don't that, that aren't a part of this uh, bigger system, the people that are just growing for themselves or the, they're helping a few select people or they're selling uh, some of their crops and selling some of their fruits and some of their vegetables and stuff. They, they could care less about them. Like, who cares? what happens to them, right? They're worried about the the big people, the ones that are growing for the stores, the ones that are growing for, um, you know, that have contracts with the government to distribute their product. Oh, I agree because look at what COVID has done is wiped out almost every small business and independently owned business mm-hmm. across the world. So everything's back to corporate control of all business, pretty much. I'm not gonna say hundred percent, but comparatively to let's say 2018, when everybody was Airbnb and all the travel thing, everybody independent business, let's start this. Let's do it. it was like a wheel, wild west, wheeling, dealing. Everybody was starting their own business, completely getting off, off the teat of the gov and, you know, really going out and starting their own thing. But, you know, how many businesses have, have gone out of business since the COVID thing? A Millions, lot. plural. So again, <laughs> yeah. if you would, you take it just to the same way, you know, if you're not in the corporate usage of inputs and then returns back to like Kellogg's, for example, factory uh, type production. Yeah, you're right. You're in competition with that. The, the, the thing that I see with the, or the restrictions was to wipe out all small business. Well, not all, you need to wipe out all small farms. So then everything still comes under corporate control. And now it's just the next step of consolidation and control. But, you know, business is one thing and then food supply is quite the other. So if you can bring both of those and wipe out everything on the on, on the, you know, like I say, it's a small side. So everything is corporate and gigantic that's it. The, the cards have been stacked against us to such a degree that it's almost so overwhelming, David, that it's almost impossible to see any way out. Right. But, but we can, we can get a way out. Right. And I don't have that uh, solution. I don't have that, um, you know, what, what we can really do besides, you know, uh, take care of yourself and, and do the things that you need to do, stock up, create, um, learn a trait, you know, learn welding, learn and and do things, uh, learn survival skills, learn how to be a a productive member of society, like be, figure out uh, electrical work, you know, plumbing, like all of these things are going to be very, very essential in the near future because everything is going to collapse. It all has to collapse everything still has to go. They still have to collapse all of the old systems to get everybody on board with a new one. And if we, go the, if we go the opposite direction and we get the um, freedom for everyone, right? The, the golden age of humanity, right? Where everyone's living in harmony, where things are uh, good for everyone everything still has to collapse. Right? We're in a very critical time right now. Right? And these things just don't happen overnight. It's a long and slow process. It's a long and slow subversion. Right? Because again, they have to trick us right? in order to trick us into thinking that it's our idea. And I know, and I've said that a few times already, but it's the, it's the truth. It's 100% the truth. Anything that happens in our reality is all tricked to make us think that it's our idea. So look at the opposite thing, whatever they're promoting, do the opposite, whatever they're saying, do the opposite. If they're saying that it's up, it's down. If they're saying it's left, then it's right. You know, and that's the really the best advice that I can give anyone. Right. And to see through all of the illusions and stop giving your power away to illusionary outside sources to get you hooked into a certain view of reality. How many thousands of years has this been going on? If not millions. Mm. As I've been told by others, you know, this is not the first rodeo. This has been going on. This is a multi millennia, multi-century, reset, cycle, reset, recycle, reset, cycle, reset, cycle, just during this time, during the interglacials 
but what it was occurring during the time of full glaciation when weather patterns had stabilized for 40,000 years after full ice, you know, two miles of ice over Chicago, Cleveland, whatever, Buffalo, those weather patterns stabilized for 40,000 years, far longer than anything, four times longer than anything we understood in agricultural history here. It was like 7,000 years, they were just didn't know the new row cropping and they didn't understand the exact plant, the exact harvest date, like we wired it out. Now it's for certain specific heirloom seed varieties, et cetera. Okay, that's 7,000 years. They were talking 40,000 years of extremely stable climate. And then coming out of the Younger Dryas era and that'll go and make, get mixed up. And something brought us out of the ice age, you know, 21,000 years ago, it started to, to shift. And then, you know, what was that catalyst? Cause there was nobody driving their SUVs around and whatnot. So, you know, are these control mechanisms the same ones that would have been set in place to control the populace for 40,000 years on the planet during the ice age? And what about the last previous interglacial with no information from that? And what about the one prior to that? And those 40,000 years of stabilization and these, you know, 7,000 years of the interglacial of stabilization, you know, it just goes from pattern of uh, weather, nature stabilizing, and then it seems control systems right on top of that stabilization. We're coming into a time now, magnetic field shifting, uh, May of 2023, it's supposed to hit 40 degrees. And once it does that, it's going to get into we weaker field strength lines and shoo, it'll just go where it wants to faster. A lot of things uh, on the just natural side in the solar system here happening, but then, you know, the control mechanisms on top of these events, we're coming into a flux or a chaos event now. That's a change of an age. It's just the beginning of this, the change of the cycle. It'll stabilize itself eventually in five, six, seven generations. But once that stabilization reoccur reoccurs, then what's going to be riding on top of that as a control mechanism? Because right now, you're right, everything's going to shift, bend, break, morph, twist, whatever you like to do, through these next several generations of change, because we're right at the cusp of the beginning of the change of the cycle. It's not going to be an instantaneous event. Is it, this is the beginning of it. Yep. It's going to take many generations for this to roll out and complete itself. Yeah, they are. Uh, they're currently preparing for a, a really big um, natural disaster, a big yeah, natural, a uh, huge one that is potentially going to be catastrophic. And we've gotten so much programming for that. You know, the the natural disaster programming. I mean, the, the new movie, Don't Look Up, an asteroid. Like, we, we've been hearing about asteroids and stuff for, for decades now. It seems like we're NASA's always, oh, there was an asteroid that came really, really close to Earth. It barely just missed us. You know what I mean? So there's a, there's so much programming for a natural disaster, and they're, they're not going to tell us about it. They're not going to tell us about it until it's too late. Right. And, and they already know. They already know about it. Now, again, I don't know what this natural disaster is going to be. I, I have absolutely no idea. But I know that one is coming. And I know that it's going to be really, really big. And they are preparing for it right now as we speak. Let me set up the, the construct for our next talk here, Ryder. I got a date for you. Okay. So, you know, I've been really heavily focused on the outer planets and the way they're in that, the way they sit in their orbits. I call it a square. You can call it planetary geometry, whatever you like to refer to that as where the planets sit in their orbits in the heavens. Well, when we're coming up to October of 2024, the planets, the way they will sit up there is the same that would repeat in 79 AD. So this is a once in a 2000 year planetary uh, reconstruction geometry. It's not an alignment by any means. It's a square up there of just where the planets magnetically, Earth will be between the sun and that new second magnetic field in October of 2024. It's gonna be on the right, we're gonna be in the middle and the sun to the left. But as we exit October, we start to swing around in front of the sun. So as we come into like, you know, springtime Northern hemisphere, that's gonna be Earth, sun, all the magnetic giants behind it, weakening incredibly weak magnetosphere where like a grain of dust will probably make it to the surface. Now, at that point, the triangulation in the way it is, magnetically, everything's going to be pulled onto our planet and there will be nothing in front of us blocking. There will be no Jupiter, Saturn, anything to pull any debris away from us. We are going to be going headlong into streams of debris for six, six months solid 
there will be no gravitational help from any other body in our solar system except pulling it to us, smashing it through our atmosphere. And I encourage everybody out there to take a look at solarsystemscope.com. It's a free software. You just run it online on your browser. You don't need to download anything. Just press run and then move, move the planets out. And you'll see what I mean. Once, once it gets to, you know, to about six months, yeah, you know, March of 2025, we're literally sitting out there by ourselves with everything pulling, all those massive, massive gravitational bodies pulling everything at them from one single direction. But we're the thing that's in front of that one single direction for six months. Our planet is going to be pummeled. After we go through the magnetics and the plasma in the skies, and then you're going to get the debris raining in from the heavens. That's going to be an interesting couple of years. See, it all, it all adds up to these big cycles repeating. People knew, governments in power knew, they all understand these cycles of cyclicity. Well, this world can't be salvaged. It's kind of, and it's run its end course. It was great. We used the tech to build a bunch of underground places. We used the tech to build a bunch of high-tech weaponry so they can protect and then reset up their control structures after this event's over. Wow, I guess we just got played. But anyway, we any did last thoughts for you? Last <laughs> we thoughts? did, we did, David. And that's exactly that's exactly right. I mean, we live on a very unstable planet. These cataclysms happen every so often. But again, they're not they don't tell us that. They they turn it into something that that we are doing to create it. Right. And and they decided to make money off of that. They're like, oh, how can we, um, how can we make people, uh, how can we tax the air, right? How can we make money off of the air? It's going to be a new pillar of the new money structure because if you're using carbon credits as a base of one of the pillars of the new economic system, everything going to revolve around that. It's not to forget, you know, the, the money is one thing, but have a base pillar of a new currency. And that would be one of the base pillars, which goes into not allowing anybody in sections of forest that then could be uh, run through an algorithm of an average tree species. And then from there, you could see how much carbon would be sequestered, but then you couldn't let anybody live on the forest or use it. You'd have to remove people completely out of the equation, digitize that and set the forest aside as a, as, as a carbon capture, a known value, and then plug that into the, the, the carbon credit system. And then that would be a base pillar, but you need to set off like really tens of millions of, of uh, square kilometers or whatever uh, for us to run that because that would be a quantifiable, measurable value, but there could be no human input into it. So humans would be, have to remove from like, you know, a quarter of the planet for this scheme to work. <laughs> it's a pillar of the new economy. <laughs> Leave your comments below. See what you liked about our uh, talk today. And again, you know, I was trying to frame it for the next talk as well. I was limited on time because I'm out here trying to do some bush clearing today, you know, along the, the row. So we have uh, much more room to put gardens down. And then we it's right next to the, to the creek down there. So we're going to, you know, op widen it completely out, A, for the airflow access in there. So we get a lot more airflow. But then to be able to put a garden down there, much larger garden, because we're going to experiment with hay bales this year by doing hay bale gardening. Uh, and that's the way it'll be. So, you know, we're doing a lot of land clearing right now because there's no leaves on it, which saves you an enormous amount of time in bulk. So you just uh, left with sticks. And then my buddy Ryan's here and we're going to do a lot of collecting because we ripped up a bunch of trees and roots. So we're going to be uh, going out there and he's out collecting uh, different roots. And we're going to do tinctures with those. And I'm going to go cut down some small willow trees right now. And we're going to use the entire willow tree because most time we're concerned, like don't cut too much bark because you don't want to kill the tree. But since we're cutting them down anyway, we're going to try to do a mass batch of, uh, you know, willow tinctures and see what we can do for this type of thing. Because we got, you know, two 20 foot trees that we're cutting down. So it's all about the land clearing is one thing to get the land more utilized or usable. But at the same time, when we're clearing, what are the natural medicines that are in those barks, the roots? the stems because there's no leaves right now so do you, do you have any sap trees there yeah we sure do and i've been out notching a bunch of stuff to see what kind of sap it's a little early for the sap to run probably another two to three weeks but i want to notch a bunch of stuff out so when the sap runs it'll go in there first so you know i go around a couple of two three days take a look at the different saps that are running we got this cherry tree this most beautiful red sap coming out of it and, yeah uh, tap those trees dude tap all of them yeah get right. all that sap out of there Yep. So again, you know, there's a lot of things that we're learning about. What are the natural medicines around here from the roots? If you're going to land clear, 
and something has value of a root that could be turned into a tincture or a dried herb that could be made a tea, whatever. I don't know. Barks, the cambium inside. I'm interested in trying to do the cherry tree. We got knocked down one by accident. So I want to get the cambium out of the cherry tree and see what that tastes like cooking it up versus the pine tree, which I don't like too much. It's always just, yeah, mm. <laughs> pine tree cambium. I guess if you're starving. Okay. But I heard these other trees taste a little better. So, you know, we got a mimosa tree uh, for the cambium and also this cherry tree and a one hickory tree. So these are already cut down and they're already dead and, and they're ripped out the roots. So we're going to try all these different parts of the trees and see what we can do with it. So let me know how that goes for sure. And if anybody wants to uh, check out my channel, I talk about all kinds of crazy stuff over there. So uh, come on over if you raised if by you giants, like, raised by giants. Yeah. I uh, release a video every, every week on a Tuesday at 6 PM PST. And I talk about all kinds, it's a different topic every week. And uh, if you want to come over there, I'd very much appreciate it. And, and I'll put the link below to Ryder's channel there, Raised by Giants, so you don't have to look for it online. You can just click and go. Anyway, thanks for spending your valuable time with us today. Hope you got something out of our conversation that can help you moving forward to get more prepared for your families, your friends, and our communities as these things do manifest the change as we get through 2022. A lot more change than the last couple of years. Last couple of years is just a smidgen of change. This year, I believe, is going to be the massive change year. Wrap your head around that for a minute. Anyway, thanks for watching and bye for now.